Please welcome to the TEDx SF stage, Adam Bosworth. I want to tell a story today with an unlikely hero and an unlikely innovation, a very simple innovation, that we all need to overcome a very big problem. But before I tell the story, if I can advance the slide, I want to tell a story first about what does it take to build any innovation. To make any innovation, three things have to be true. I used to just talk about two, the psychology and the physics. But these days I talk about three. You have to build something people want. And oddly, in the area we live now, Silicon Valley, that is the thing most often forgot. People fall in love with technology, with data, with all sorts of ideas, and stop asking themselves, would the normal person actually want to use this product? And then the products fail. You have to build something that's actually doable. It's wonderful to think about something where you simply talk to your car and it does all the right things, but half the time it's more irritating than it is useful. And you have to think about, will it pay for itself? So if you're going to overcome the problems I'm about to talk about, those three things must always be in your mind. Is the psychology right, is the cost right, and is the physics right? We were looking at solving two very hard problems. One is just changing people's behavior. It's very hard to change people's behavior. Typically, people have developed behavior as a coping skill. They have the behavior they have because it helps them deal with the kinds of issues we heard about earlier today. And so you throw um, leverage at them, you offer them incentives, you give them training, you have personal coaches, usually strangers, who call you and jawbone you about what you should be doing. And by and large, none of it works. You apply all this money and all this effort to getting people to change their behavior, and lo and behold, six months later, they're pretty much the people they were six months before. Because these were their coping skills. These are skills they've developed over their entire life to deal with the issues that they face in their everyday world. So changing behavior all by itself is very difficult. At the same time, we need to get people to improve their health. I'm going to talk more about this in a moment, but fundamentally, we have developed this Rube Goldberg machine, both in this country and even in the rest of the world, for trying to get people to improve their health. We've turned it into an extraordinarily clinical process. We've turned it into a process that is all about waiting for you to be very sick and then using all sorts of data and all sorts of predictive analysis to try and treat you once you're very sick. We've turned it into a thing that looks at your labs and not at your heart. And yet, as we're about to see, this is not the real problem. So the question that we asked ourselves was, can we simultaneously change people's behavior and change how they think about wellness, how they actually keep themselves healthy? How do they avoid getting sick? And can we solve these problems at once? bearing in mind that neither problem on its own sounds particularly solvable. Now, before I talk about what we did, and there is a happy story here, I want to talk about how bad the problem is. 30 years ago, we were not facing such a big problem. 30 years ago, it was virtually unheard of to have a state where more than 15% of the people were obese, and 10 years before that, 10% of them were obese. Only 30 years ago. Really one generation with the frequency with which we have kids today. As recently as just two years ago, however, those states in the dark red that you see are at 40% or more obesity. We roll out to every company we can find across the world, and what we see in every company in the United States is that over half of the people are dangerously overweight, and over a third are obese. And the reason we see this is basic statistics, because in the US, over half the people are overweight, and over one third are obese. There are terrible consequences to this, not just the cost that we see, Eight time, four times as expensive per person, or $2.5 trillion per year that we're spending, far more than the bailout and growing faster. But the terrible consequences go further. But to fix this, we must understand how to fix, what the psychology is. And the psychology is stress and fear. People are eating more comfort food because they're afraid of their jobs. They're afraid they'll be fired, they'll be unemployed, they'll be on their street, and their kids won't be educated. If we're going to solve this, we have to deal with the psychology. And we looked at how do we deal with this? How do we actually take the thing that is giving them comfort and make it fun for them? And the answer is we make it fun by making it a game. We deploy something that is intrinsically enjoyable, and games are intrinsically enjoyable. People like games. They have obstacles, they have problems, and they figure out to do the right thing, and they're rewarded for it. And it is easy to structure a game to get you to do the right thing, to eat less, to eat more veggies, to work out, and to relax, and to breathe. 
the thing that caused your problem in the first place. But a game is not sufficient. Games wax and wane. So we had to ask ourselves, how do we get the people you trust, you care about, and that you're accountable to, to constantly support you in this endeavor? Well, who do you see the most? Who do you see eight hours a day? Who do you talk to the most? It turns out you talk to the most and see the most your spouses, perhaps your kids, and the people you work with at work. Not your friends, interestingly enough, and you don't want to talk to your friends about being healthy necessarily. So the workplace turns out to be the surprise hero in this. They have both the reason, the motivation, and the ability to deploy to you the social support to play this game, and it is unusual to be able to have fun in a workplace. There is another thing we use, small group theory. We organize around teams, small teams. This means you're accountable to people you care about and work with every day, and they care about you. The incentives are organized there. If you slack off, they drag you along, because if you don't do your part, they will not get what they want out of this. So the people who matter most to you and to whom you matter most are the people who pull you along. So if we review this solution, deploying into the workplace a game designed to make you healthy, to harness the social metrics of the workplace and small group dynamics, we see the psychology works. These are the people you care about and it's fun. The cost is trivial, a few dollars a person instead of a few thousand dollars per person. And with the cloud, this is doable, and with mobile, this is deployable. So we've learned something very surprising in our adventure to try and figure out how to make people healthy, and we now know this works. We've learned that business and the workplace can be the most effective collaboration system in human history, and we can actually use it to cause people to change their behavior and change the world, starting with health. Thank you.